Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what data journalism is, um, my involvement in it, um, uh, you know, how it's used in journalism generally, where it's going. Um, a little bit more background on myself. Um, as has been said, I, I teach uh, data journalism at Birmingham City University, where I run a, a dedicated MA in data journalism, as well as an MA in multi-platform journalism. Uh, I also work in the BBC England Data Unit, which happens to be based in Birmingham, although it's, it's um, doing stories nationally. Um, and alongside that, the BBC Shared Data Unit, which is part of the um, Local Democracy Project. I don't know uh, how many of you are aware of that, but this is the project which um, employs around 150 journalists to, work, to report on courts and councils. So it's trying to fill the gap that's been left by a lot of um, the, the redundancies in local newspapers. So those reporters are one part of that. The data unit is another part. And um, every three months, about four journalists from lo mainly local newspapers will come in and spend three months learning data journalism skills and working on an investigation. Um, and it's been really fascinating to see the impact of that on, on the kind of use of data and the ability of local journalists to use data to do investigations and, and it's really um, shaped, shaped data journalism in, in local newspapers. Um, so as well as, as well as that work, uh, I've written a number of books, so um, most of them, many of them about data journalism, some of them about online journalism more generally, so the online journalism handbook some of you might be familiar with, which um, came out in its second edition a couple of years ago. Um, I'm going to move away from that creaky <laughs> part of the floor. Um, uh, but in terms of data journalism specifically, there's a book called The Data Journalism Heist, um, which covers some of the uh, stuff I'll be going over today. Um, finding stories in spreadsheets, which does what it says, and scraping for journalists. I'll talk about what scraping is later as well. So I've been busy. Um, and um, what I actually do, what data journalism does, well, first of all, let's, let's um, break it down. I basically do... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, is your mic through? Let me see. So I see a green light. Well, that's fine. Yeah. I don't hear much, but... Okay. Yeah, I can't hear anything coming through, but I'm projecting anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I do what every journalist does. I identify story leads, I identify story ideas. I'm going to talk about how um, I come up with those ideas and how my colleagues come up with I those ideas and spot those leads. Um, and sometimes the data is involved in that, sometimes not. Um, I then go about pursuing those leads and those story ideas. And sometimes the data helps with that, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes, uh, and also I obviously then tell those stories. Um, and that might involve data journalism techniques. But it's the same process as all journalism. And, and one of the mistakes or misperceptions, if you like, um, that people have of data journalism is that it's somehow separate from um, traditional journalism or normal journalism. In fact, you'll even get some situations uh, where a data journalist in an organisation will be told something like, uh, by another part of the organisation, um, you do your work and then we'll do the journalism, as if what we're doing isn't the journalism. So we get really pissed off <laughs> when people say that. Because quite often we're doing the hard lifting, the investigative stuff, but also fun stuff, as we'll come on to say. Um, Data journalism can be quite intimidating. Um, it's difficult to know where to start, and it's easy to think that um, you know you have to be some sort of master. There's there's a phrase for this. It's called a unicorn in the industry. Um, so someone who can do everything. They can they can run program. They can use spreadsheets. They can write FOI requests. Um, and the reason it's called a unicorn is these people don't exist. They're mythical. So this is Carmen. Carmen was a former student of mine. She's now Sky News' uh, first data journalist. And I did a little top trumps card for her. Um, and so Carmen is very good with spreadsheets. Um, she's very good with database, probably less so with coding, uh, maybe somewhere in the middle in terms of FOI. Um, 
Uh, if you look, took another data journalist, we would have a different profile again. So we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Some of us are very good at making pretty charts and interactives and, and really fancy stuff. Some of us don't know how to do that at all. Some of us can write code, some of us can't. Some of us are great at FOI requests and, and uh, getting information out of leaks and things like that. Some of us less so. Um, so there's no one kind of set of skills. And really what happens with most data journalists is they start off being good at one particular thing and then they expand into others. So when I first started over a decade ago, um, I started doing stuff in spreadsheets. And then I wanted to use the Freedom of Information Act to get information for those spreadsheets. So I learned how to do that. And then I wanted to write code that could grab information off websites. So I learned some programming. And then I wanted to make the charts really good for the resulting stories. So then I learned more about visualization. And I just added more and more skills as I went on. So, um, I was asked to write an introduction for a book called The Data Journalism Handbook, which is well worth um, getting. It's free, it's online. The second edition is in the middle of coming out as well. And the problem with writing an introduction is you have to kind of define the territory. And, um, and so this is the definition I came up with. Um, first of all, data journalism is data that uses journalism. That was the easy part. Okay? But what do we mean by data? What do we mean by journalism? Well, data is basically structured information. That's not necessarily the same thing as a spreadsheet. So the information you're dealing with doesn't have to be in a spreadsheet for it to be structured. It could be speeches, it could be tweets, it could be um, any information. The key thing is that it has to be structured. And a large part of the skill of data journalism is being able to spot that structure and spot the opportunity to create that structure. Um, sometimes data journalism is the process of creating that structure so that we can make something interactive. Sometimes the resulting story doesn't look like data at all. It doesn't have any numbers in it at all. All the data journalism work is behind the scenes. But the, the key point that I was making with this quote is that you know, it can be the source of the information we're using or it can be the tool with which we tell the story. But like any source, um, just because it's data doesn't mean it's factual, doesn't mean it's true. It's one person's version of events. It has the appearance of factualness, but that doesn't necessarily mean we should instantly believe it. So we should always treat it with the same sort of scepticism that we would any claim, no matter how believable or authoritative the source. Um, and also, like any tool, uh, that shapes what we can do. So as, as journalists, and particularly you know, those of you studying journalism, you should be critical of the, the ways that we do journalism, the way that the newsroom shapes what we do. The fact that we're using a camera shapes our journalism in a different way to when we're just writing for a newspaper or a website, or if we're recording for a, a radio station. Um, there is also, as I've, as I've kind of said, a lot to it. So there is actually getting hold of the data in the first place. That's a whole set of skills. Cleaning it up. So uh, we're getting rid of problems in the data, like inconsistencies. Uh, bad data. Um, we might need to put it into context. So, if we're talking about crimes, you know, how many people are there in that area? What's the crimes per person, for example? To do that, we probably have to combine it with other data. And then there's communicating the story at the end. Now, visualization, creating charts and infographics and interactives, is just one way of telling a data story. You can write a text narrative, you can make it uh, human, which is what you would do in a broadcast data, data journalism story, you would have a case study. You can create tools that personalise it, here's how this affects you. Um, you can make it social, so the BBC did a, a piece of data journalism a few years ago when the world's population hit 7 billion. And you 
you could kind of find out what number you were. And then after you'd found out what number you were in that 7 billion, you could then tweak that result and say, hey, I'm number 6 billion whatever. And that made it into a social experience. It was personalized and it was social. And it was, a, it was massively successful, partly thanks to that. So that's what data journalism is. We're working with structured data. And there's a lot of data around, which is one of the reasons why this is uh, increasingly in demand. But I want to start with the stories. A lot of people start with the, um, you know, let's, let's work with a spreadsheet. But we need a reason to work with a spreadsheet. We need to know if a spreadsheet is, in fact, what we need to use. Um, and broadly speaking, I would say there's two types of stories that you're going to be dealing with as a data journalist, or indeed as a journalist who happens to be working with data. Um, and those are reactive stories and proactive stories. So reactive stories are when you're reacting to events. So what would be a situation this week? Coronavirus, okay. So I was, I was in the BBC data unit yesterday. What was my colleague doing? Um, getting the data on the numbers of cases in the UK and setting it up so that he could take a snapshot of that every day so he would be able to tell the story of, of the growth of those numbers in the next few weeks. That was him reacting to data becoming available or something being topical. Likewise, the unemployment figures are a classic reactive data story. So in a reactive situation, you're uh, often reacting to some information that everyone else has as well. And the priority is probably going to be speed. You've not got time to create some really rich, um, in-depth uh, piece of journalism because you're up against a deadline, you're competing against others. Proactive stories are where you come up with an idea or you've got a tip off and you've got more time to work on it because no one else has an idea the same or is doing it in the same way or has the same information you have. So reactive stories, if you're reacting to new information, then quite often you're gonna tell stories about who's top or who's bottom. So the A-level results come out, school results come out, which school is doing best, which school is doing worst. That's going to be the story you do. It probably shouldn't take more than half an hour to an hour to establish that fact and then pursue it. Uh, something unusual happening. Um, so unemployment has doubled. Um, the coronavirus you know, cases of triple. Uh, we often look at to see if a policy is working or not. So when the unemployment data comes out, really the story that we're telling is, um, is government policy on employment or on the economy working? If unemployment is going up, that's a sign that government policy is not working. Um, if the numbers of people appealing against uh, benefit decisions successfully goes up, then that's a sign that that policy is not working. And a lot of these, a lot of the time when we're reacting to new information, we're really telling the story of um, how well or how badly the people in charge are doing, whether that's the government, the police, the health service, whoever. We might be looking at trends, uh, the numbers of people buying clothes from Primark is going up, the numbers of people buying clothes from Zara is going down. Um, the numbers of goals scored from outside the penalty area is going up. The numbers of yellow cards is going down. Failing all of those stories, what we will often reach for is what I would call the striking statistic, the big number. And if you see a story with a big number in the headline that doesn't necessarily actually mean much, that's probably the sign that someone's got to the bottom of this list. And it probably isn't that much of a story. <laughs> So it might be something like, government spends 20 billion on railways. Is that a big number? Is it a lot? Is it not much? Um, it's not being put into context. So, um, so if we can't tell any other story, it's probably likely to be someone is spending a lot of money on something. But it might not be that much money in context. You know, 300 people have now got coronavirus. 700 people have now got coronavirus. We don't know if that's a big number or if it's not. If we said the numbers of people had doubled, 
That's different. That's putting it into context. So some examples of that. Rough sleeping figures come out. Um, every year in the BBC unit, we do a story on this. Um, so figures are up 16%. That's the trend. That's the story that we've done on that. But actually, we've focused on a reaction to that. So the story isn't the figure so much as the reaction to that. Partly because the figure might not be that surprising. Um, new figures come out about the journeys made on trains. Uh, the Evening Standard does a story about which are the busiest train stations. These have been revealed. Uh, gender pay gap figures, which, what are we in now? At the end of this month, the final figures for, the, for gender pay gap uh, for every company that has to report it in the UK, they will be out at the end of the year. Um, so the final figure is 78% um, of, of firms have a gap in favour of men. So this is kind of like a, a, a striking statistic story. A lot of companies pay men more than women. Um, but there's a little bit of context in that it's a percentage rather than just, you know, um, 7,800 companies pay, women more, uh, pay men more than women. Proactive stories, as I said, are where you have got an idea or a lead or a tip-off or some information that's exclusive to you. Um, you might, for example, decide to tell the story of what's the, you know, what's the state of the nation. So when the uh, census data comes out, uh, when the last census came out, one of the stories that was told about that was we are becoming less religion, religious as a country. So, um, so we, would, we would find the areas that were least religious in the census and we would go and interview people there and tell a story about that. Kind of hold up a mirror to society. Um, now that might be at country level, but it could also be at a sector level. So it could be something like, um, let's look at the numbers of um, schools with highly paid heads. Let's hold a mirror up to that. Snapshot. Uh, we might tell a story that's about differences between areas, what's called a postcode lottery story. So, you know, in Newcastle, you're twice as likely to be stopped by police under stop and search laws than you are in Bolton, for example. Um, or your access to um, certain health facilities in Birmingham is much uh, worse than it is in Norfolk. And that's generally in a situation where you would expect if things are fair, that, uh, that they should be broadly the same. Um, and those are common investigation types. Commonly in investigations, we're looking for disparities, inequalities, unfairness. So that's quite a common one that we might look at. We might also look at some claim that's been made by probably someone in a position of power, political or otherwise and say, is that claim actually supported? We might fact check it, we might um, look at what basis they have for making that statement. So we might, a classic one is, we're spending more on schools than ever before. Well that's because, perhaps strictly speaking, that's true, but that's because there are more people, there are more schools than ever before. But actually, in terms of per school or per person, maybe you're not spending as much or more. This number four is what people often try to do, and I would caution against. So one of the things that people often want to do with data is say, this thing is causing that thing. You know, we're seeing more knife crime, and police numbers are down. So let's do a story about how cuts to the police have caused a rise in knife crime. Um, there's a reason I've called that things happen together. I've not caused it, I've not called it, things cause other things. Because this is the difference between uh, causation and correlation. So 
correlation is two things happening together. Um, there might be a strong relationship between those two things, but that doesn't prove that one thing causes another. And as journalists, it's very rare that we can tell a story, but we can actually prove that one thing causes another. So the most that we can do is say that these two things are both going up, or this thing has gone down as this other thing has gone up. Um, so uh, one story that I worked on, let's see if I can bring it up. Uh, so we worked on a story about unsolved crime. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen, that's why. Um, here we go. <coughs> So this was a story uh, I worked on with my colleague Dan about looking at crimes in the last five years and how many were unsolved and the rate was going up so we got a trend story, particular types of crimes, particular areas were worse than others so we also got a post called Lottery. Um, now the background to this is that yes police numbers are being cut but we're not going to say that that's caused this. Um, what we might do is go and speak to an academic expert who's done some proper research um, and is, is perhaps establishing more rigorously some sort of causation. Or we might go to someone um, who can speak with authority about what it's actually like in, in that uh, industry and why more crimes might be going unsolved. We might get an individual officer who talks about why they're not pursuing particular crimes. And what this data is doing, what this kind of finding is doing, is, is helping, first of all, point us towards uh, who we could be speaking to. Secondly, what questions we could be asking. And most importantly, it's given us a, a big picture. It's establishing that any of the interviews we do, um, well, put it this way, there's a difference between a story which says a police officer says that they're not investigating as many crimes as they're used to. That's just an anecdote. How do we establish that that police officer, that their experience is not just a personal experience? How do we establish how widespread this is? So one of the big strengths of data journalism is it helps us establish a scale of something. It helps us establish a factual basis for something. Um, and it helps us uh, be more confident in the questions that we ask and the direction that we take. So that's, um, so things happening together. Uh, generally I would avoid trying to, try to prove causation. The, the reason being that even scientists struggle to prove causation. When a, when a scientist seeks out to prove that one thing causes another, what they have to do is isolate all the variables, all the things that could be causing something. So, take an obvious example, smoking and cancer. Okay? It took a long time for scientists to prove um, with a, you know, a significant amount of confidence that smoking causes <coughs> cancer. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is you've got lots of other factors. Poverty. You know, you're more likely to smoke if you're poorer. So, is the cancer caused by the smoking or is it caused by the fact that people have less money and less access to particular things, their diet might be different. There's all sorts of other potential causes for that. Uh, they might work in industries which prevent a high, present a higher risk of cancer. So it's very difficult to isolate all those variables, even as a scientist, let alone as a journalist. You might find that there is a lack of data, and that in itself can be a story. If you set out to find out something and you can't get the data on it, and you think really there should be data on this, then, um, then you might end up with a story about calls for there to be more transparency about whatever it is. In the US, for example, um, Many, um, there were lots of stories, anecdotes about people from ethnic minorities being shot by police. When journalists set out to find out how widespread is this problem beyond these anecdotes, these individual and very tragic experiences, the police said, We don't collect information on that. We don't collect information on when a, when a police officer shoots someone and, and 
um, what the ethnicity was of the person who was shot. So that becomes a story about, well, why are you not doing this? And that led to, a, to a, a project, a couple of projects in the US and the UK to collect information on that. In the UK, the Bureau, uh, Bureau Local uh, wanted to find out about how many homeless people had died. Again, there was no collection of that information. So they set out to manually create that structured information, create that data set. That data did not exist. As a result, the Office uh, for National Statistics uh, now collects information on the deaths of homeless people. So that was part of the impact that they had. And finally, it might be that the information is flawed. Um, so you find bizarre things in the data. Um, you, when you start to ask questions and do interviews, you're told that, that that's not true, and you start to look more deeply into it. You don't necessarily believe that person when they say that, but you do um, pursue that line. And indeed, in that story about the unsolved thefts, some of the data was wrong, and some of the police forces um, had to um, basically admit that they had the wrong data and that they had to change their, um, their processes. So that was one of the impacts of that story, was we got the police to actually start collecting data properly, and the people in charge of, of regulating them. Uh, some examples of that then, again, gender pay gap. Um, you might drill down, you know, what's the gender pay gap like in the North East? What's the gender pay gap like in Birmingham? What about academy schools? What about government bodies? Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? These are examples where an individual has, has had a specific idea and decided to drill down into existing data. Um, this is a personal favourite that... that Director of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism at the time. Uh, this was at a time when payday loans were very much in the news. And he just had the idea, actually, how much have these companies grown? Again, there was no kind of spreadsheet out there with this information on. All he did was go to a company's house, look at the company accounts for the last few years of the biggest companies in this field, create a little spreadsheet himself and calculate how much those companies wrong. Um, and that was the story. Quite straightforward. Um, I'm looking at an area at the moment in social care and there's a particular company that, that operates in this area and to get an, an idea of what's happening I've looked at their company accounts and I can see their, prof their turnover, the amount of money that they're dealing with, has really increased in the last couple of years. So that tells me that more people are um, using their services, which helps me with that story. And also the directors are paying themselves a lot more money. How many uh, car crashes outside schools? Now again, you'll notice that this story isn't just about the crashes, it's actually about the calls for a speed limit. And this is um, something that often, that's often worth thinking about in, in, when you're doing a story with data, is um, if someone actually is going to take action as a result of that data or is calling for action, that might be a better story than the numbers themselves. Or indeed, you might have two stories. You might do your initial story and then a follow-up on what people are asking to be done, calling for to be done, actually doing about it. Um, so here are six, six ways... I've given you sort of uh, 10 or 11 types of stories, but also these are six ways that you can use data to get a story link. It's not just about news. So, you know, this new data tells us this. Um, it could be that you use the data to find an interview. So, um, let me show you an example. This one. Um, so this, uh, you know, have companies actually changed anything one year on? Um, and this one, in these cases, the journalist has used the data to identify particular organisations that were doing badly, and then they've gone off and interviewed them. What are you actually doing? Um, 
or you might profile a particular person or a particular company. Uh, the reaction and action I've already mentioned, so the data leads you to find someone who reacts to that data or calls for action as a result of, that, of it. Um, an explainer is, again, I'll give you some examples. Excuse me, also on gender, gender pay gaps. Um, so, you know, what you need to know about it, what we've learned about it, what does it mean? This is the holding a mirror up to society type of story. Um, you can create what I would call explorers, so where, where you're allowing the user to explore some sort of issue through the data. Um, uh, maps are quite useful for this, so it might be something like you know, food hygiene inspections, explore, see how restaurants near you have done. And you create an interactive map and people can explore it themselves. Um, I'll show you what I mean by you draw it. Has anyone seen you draw it? New York Times thing? I love this. Um, what I love about this is it's, it's tackling a big um, challenge that we have as journalists at the moment. I was waiting for that. Uh, I don't want to create a free account. Um, I know what I do because other organisations have copied this. No. I'll try another approach. So the idea is. Um, this one might do, or this one. Um, so you might think you know, you know, house prices, um, but instead of just showing you a chart, you ha you're invited to kind of say, okay, I think house prices did kind of this, and then let's see how right I am. I wasn't too far off, actually. Um, <laughs> given I was pretty uh, slapdash about that. Um, so it, it, it's inviting me to explore it. It's not necessarily, here's something new that happened today. This, this information has already been there, but we're coming up with um, a new way of talking about it, and probably there's some sort of topical hook. Um, so, you know... A classic example of this at the moment would be everything you need to know about the last three pandemics. You know, you draw it. You, you try and guess what the, what the kind of infection rate was. Um, and the great thing about this is, is it's not necessarily saying here's a fact and you're wrong and you're stupid. It's saying come and have a play with it and then we'll show you the real thing and we're not actually explicitly telling you that you're stupid. Um, but hopefully you're wiser by the end of it. Um, and then, uh, like I said, a story about the lack of data or concerns over quality. Um, so here's another interactive example. This was, this was my idea. I was quite pleased about this. Um, so um, there's a day in the year uh, on the 10th of November, which is uh, equal pay day. And that's the day that... Um, on average in the UK, uh, because men are uh, generally paid more than women, um, on the 10th of November, effectively, women stop being paid, and then men get paid another kind of six weeks or so. Um, if, if you imagine everyone was paid at the same rate, that, that would um, illustrate the way that, that men, over the course of the year, earn the equivalent of six weeks' wages more. And I thought, well, actually, there'll be regional variation here. So we're talking about a bit of a postcode lottery. Um, and it's, so this is an interactive uh, inviting you to explore, OK, in the, in the area where you live, when is equal pay day? Is it the 10th of November? Or um, is it later, which means that the gender pay gap is smaller? Um, 
men and women are more equal but not equal? Indeed, is it in the year after, which would mean that women are paid more than men? And that was the case in some areas. Or is it earlier, which means the gender pay gap is bigger than the national average? So that's what this map shows. The orange areas are where women are paid more than men on average. Um, the dark blue areas are where the pay gap is even bigger than the national average. Um, the top example there was, were, was a, um, a Guardian example where you could just type in your company and find out what the gender pay gap was. And this is, this is another reason why data journalism um, has massively expanded as a skill in the industry because the, you know, the, the, the rise of online news, telling news online, also means new ways of telling stories. It means the ability to connect with audiences, to allow them to interact with stories. And that interactivity means that stories need to be created as data, as, as a form that people can interact with. So I need to be able to, to tell the website where I live, and then it can tell me what the gender pay gap is in my area. Or I can type in my company, my employer, and it will tell me my pay gap. Um, likewise, immigration is in the news. Let's tell a story about that. This is a story about poor quality data. So we noticed that a number of companies were reporting a zero gender pay gap and lots of unlikely uh, combinations of, of figures. So we, um, we asked questions. Uh, there's no data about refugees trying to make it to Europe. So the Guardian um, made a big thing of that. So we'll, I'm going to... Um, how many of you have got laptops? I can see quite a few already. So hopefully we'll, we'll, I'll get you to um, uh, work with some data um, in the next 10 minutes or so. The other reason is that... Because so much information is digitised, everything is zeros and ones. So it's not just, as I said, spreadsheets, but what people say, what they do. We've got live data, images, audio, video. So any guesses what painter this is? These are the top five colours for the paintings of a particular artist, as represented by pie charts. Any guesses? Fake Sorry? Fake Not Picasso. Thank God, yeah. Okay. Because you can treat every pixel and you can count, you know, the frequency of those pixels. Um, this is a nice little physical visualization of, of the frequency of use of letters on a keyboard. Um, this is an analysis of movie scripts and the direction. So this isn't the dialogue, this is the direction to, to actors or their characters. Uh, that follow the words she or he. So the most common screen direction after the word she is snuggles. The most common direction to he is straps. And you can see this, this kind of, <laughs> again on gender, uh, this kind of disparity between she, the character she in films, snuggles, giggles, squeals, sobs, weeps, blushes, clings, rocks, shrieks, hugs. Whereas he, Figures, pitches, rears, vaults, kills, howls, shot, gallops. So we're treating text as data. Relationships are data. This is a network analysis of the second Game of Thrones book. Um, the larger the circle, the more times that character appears. The thicker the line, the more times that character appears in the same sentence as the other. Um, so that's a, classed as an interaction in this particular piece of work. And the more clustered they are, the, the closer the relationships between those characters. So you can see, you can visibly see Daenerys. Have you seen Game of Thrones? Yeah, so Daenerys, uh, particularly in the, in the early uh, books or the early series, is, is literally physically in a different part of the, the kingdom, if you like. She, she's, her story is, is physically separate. Um, and you can see that in this, in this network diagram. You can see Arya is a, a connector. She has more interactions with a more diverse range of, of groups of people. And that chimes with, with if, you do, if you are familiar with the, 
the series or the books that chimes with what we know about that. And this is very good for identifying relationships, um, clusters, particular people we might want to look at, and so on. Lots of applications to this in the future. So, um, as I've said, there's lots of skills you could learn. But actually, what I'm going to cover today are some very uh, key basic skills that I would say probably 80 to 90% of data journalism stories can be done with. Um, and then after that, you can go from there and uh, get more skills, you can get more visualization skills, cleaning, scraping, whatever. Um, but we'll start with the, the basics today. I'll explain what scraping is, by the way. Scraping is the process of um, gathering, uh, basically gathering information from a series of different sources. So I'll give you a concrete example. Um, so this, this was a, a story I worked on a number of years ago. Uh, during the Olympics torch relay, when the Olympics was held in the UK, uh, they held, uh, in every Olympics, they have a torch relay. And the torch relay is where the torch is carried from Athens, the birthplace of the Olympics, to whatever city is hosting the Olympics that year. And uh, 8,000 people carry this torch one at a time. So one person will carry it for a certain distance and then they'll They'll pass on the flame to another torch and it will go through all these people until in the opening ceremony of the Olympics, um, the final torch in that relay, the 8,000th 8, torch, will light the big flame in the Olympic um, stadium uh, and the, the ceremony of the, the games will begin. So this takes six weeks. And um, in 2012, um, if, because I think in 2008 it was in Beijing, and there were protests along the route. So in 2012, the organizers didn't want any protests. So it was flown from Athens to Cornwall by David Beckham. Um, and then uh, across the, the British Isles, it was this torch was carried in this big relay by 8,000 people. It was promoted as a celebration of community of local heroes. People were invited to apply, uh, to nominate each other, not apply. So you were, you were invited to nominate local heroes who should carry the torch. And uh, claims were made that 95% of the uh, people carrying it would be these local heroes. Um, it would be a celebration of youth, so half of the people carrying the torch would be under 24, I think it was. Um, and everyone would have inspirational stories. So as a journalist, having told you that, what what are you thinking in terms of potential stories, potential data journalism stories? Where are they from? The okay, so where are they from in the country? That's, a, that's a holding up a mirror too. Who are these people? Let's find out more about them. Yeah? Uh, we can make it interactive, find out who's carrying the torch near you, which is one of the stories that we do. Okay. Sorry? <laughs> uh, a comparison of the statistics that they had in. Yes, yeah, so we're testing the claims. Because we've got some very concrete claims here. Half of them are going to be under 24. 95% of them are going to be local community heroes. Okay? Um, now, um, so I was, at, um, I was in Manchester um, as part of a project around uh, reporting on the Olympics. And I came across a website where they published all these stories, these inspirational stories of the Olympic torch bearers. And so you could, you could go to a particular day and see who was carrying the torch on that day. Um, you had their name, where they were from, where they were carrying the torch in, and what was their age and what was their story, and a picture. So that's data, yeah? It's not a spreadsheet, it's just a web page. But I'm looking at that thinking, first of all, this is, inf this is structured information. If I can get this into a spreadsheet, I can analyze this, I can work out. Um, I, can, I can find all the people from your area who carry the torch. Because people carried it in different areas. Um, I could find out how many were aged under 24. But this was scattered across hundreds of different pages. 
So what I had to do was create a scraper that went through all these pages and collected this information and then stored it in a format that I could start to ask questions of it. Um, and, and basically what I found was, no, 50% of people were not young. They were way off that target. No, 95% of people were not local heroes. In fact, there were loads and loads and loads of corporate objectives. Um, and actually, when you kind of peeked under the hood, what you realized was this was a, um, it was a massive money-making operation for the uh, Olympic Committee. Um, sponsorship of the, or just of the torch relay alone, is about, I think it's about $30 million, uh, something like that. So you had Samsung, Coca-Cola, and Lloyd's TSB with the three sponsors of the torch relay. You would have their coaches, a whole kind of promotional thing. Um, and it was public money being used to put on this thing. Meanwhile, executive deals, etc., etc. So I could talk a lot about that. But that was, uh, that was based on scraping and then doing interviews and asking questions of Adidas and people like that. Why is your executive carrying the torch? Anyway. So um, what you don't want to be is in a position of uh, this guy. Come on. I'll play you a little clip to break it up and then we'll go in some... Uh, and get you doing some stuff. So this is, this is a satirical news program. It's not real. The American car company General... Motors have today announced a cut in their workforce at their plant in Detroit. Our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan, is there at the moment. Peter, what's going on? Chris, it's a mass redundancy measure. It's the biggest layoff in American industrial history. 35,000 jobs in one fell swoop. Gone. 35,000? Yes. Peter, there's only 25,000 people at the plant. That's right, Chris. Mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale. Well, would you mind telling me how the plant can function on minus 10,000 workers? I don't know, Chris. You tell me. I'll tell you what, Peter. You mean 3,500 workers have been sacked? No. 35,000. It's all here. Let me see what you've got down there. It's 3,500. Peter, I want, to, I want to see it. I don't want to hear anything more out of your mouth. I don't believe it. Now, show me your notes. No. Yes. It's 3,500. Show me. I don't believe what you're saying. I just want to see the numbers. Now hold them up. <laughs> hold them up and keep them up. And rotate them 180 degrees in my favour. Do it. Peter, what's that? I don't have a monitor, Chris. I can't see what you you're doing. You know what I'm talking about. It's just above your right eye. Yes. A cobweb? And how is a cobweb going to dig you out of your numerical mess? I don't know. Peter, you're lying in the news grave. Do you know what's written on your headstone? News. Peter, thank you. Peter, I'm around, around, live in the... The American car... Right, so, um... Oops. So I'm going to show you some techniques for doing this yourself. First of all, any questions before I go on into the, the practicalities? Yeah? When the government issues unemployment figures, they never give you the error margin. Yeah, they, actually they do. And this it's a really good question, yeah. Yeah, so unemployment figures are, are, are a good example where... Um, so uh, unemployment figures are based on a sample, as, uh, as a lot of uh, official statistics are. And that includes a, an error margin. Um, and so if they say unemployment has gone down by, let's say, 65,000, and the, the margin of error is um, 45,000, then that means the real figure could be 45,000 higher or lower than the figure that they've given. So, the, and, and that's, that's not even necessarily all the time, but broadly speaking, a margin of error is 
um, the the margin within which their 95% confidence of being right. So the figure that they give is only the middle point in that. And you should always, when you're looking at a, an official kind of spreadsheet, you should always look in the footnotes to, to look for those sorts of pieces of information. There was a BBC story a few years ago where they said unemployment over 100,000 or something like that. And actually it was within the margin of error, which means we don't know if it, actually probably we can't say it went up because it's not larger than the, than the range within which they are 95% certain. So, yeah, thanks for that. The reason it bothers me so much is I used to be a metallurgist. And if you're doing chemical analysis, yeah. you have to include the margin of error. Yeah. It's essential, because you can tell by the composition of the material the problem. And that, to me, as a scientist, should be applied whenever you use what amounts to an estimate. Yeah. And it just bugs me because I wrote an, an article about it one time when they said that the actual figure had gone down. Yeah. But the margin of error was so large yeah. that it could have been anywhere. Yeah. It's um, and this is this has been a common problem in journalism for a number of years, is that is that journalists don't even know what a margin of error is often. Uh, they don't know to look for it in the first place. And that is improving. The statistical literacy of journalists is improving. Um, one of the... Um, it's certainly been taught more widely in, on journalism courses. Um, I'm doing a class in a couple of weeks on it. I talk about it all the way through the course at, um, at the university. And on courses like the, the BBC are training all of its journalists and data skills, and they cover some of this as well. So. Um, so there is more awareness of it. Um, there's a guy called Ben Goldacre who's well worth reading, who's written quite a lot and actually had quite a big impact on journalists' um, awareness of and ability in this area. So um, I think in the last 10 years there's been a lot, journalists have been exposed to a lot of justified criticism of, of their lack of numeracy and lack of scientific literacy. So it's, it's well worth being aware of stuff like that. The other thing about margins of error is that they only apply if, um, if you've, you've conducted a, um, a representative, if you've got a representative sample. So um, ITV News a few years ago, it was two years ago, did a survey of head teachers. Um, and they worked with the head teachers union to distribute this survey. And they did a story based on, um, I think we had about 8,000 responses. Um, and they approached, they approached me and asked, would, we, would, would I kind of help them work on this story? So uh, the students and I worked on these, these answers to these questions, most of them text, so not numerical. So we're looking for recurring words, you know, how many teachers have, have highlighted that they might close early on Fridays stuff like that. And one of the first questions I wanted to answer was, well, how many head teachers are there in England? This was in England. And how big a sample size is this? What's the margin of error? Um, and it's, it was quite a big sample. You don't necessarily need a massive sample to have a small margin of error. Um, so so um, the margin of error was <coughs> relatively small, but it was not. They, they, there had been no attempts to make that sample representative. So it wasn't like um, we're going to make sure that a quarter of the head teachers are in the North East in our sample because a quarter of teachers are in the North East. They might have had the, the answers that were missing. They might have had no answers in the North East at all. The people who might have responded to that questionnaire might be different to the people who didn't respond. So actually, um, Adding a margin of error in that situation gives it an appearance of scientific rigor that it doesn't have. It's not a scientific survey. It's, it's a very big survey, and it still tells us something, but, um, but it's not something that you can apply normal margin of errors to. Um, so without getting too kind of, I, I don't want to go in too much detail about why it is, but just to make you aware of those kinds of issues. 
Um, and one of the key differences between science and journalism is that um, sometimes we will, we will report on information which wouldn't be um, trying to think on, on how to express this, but so, say those, well, I'll take those examples of the head teachers. Um, as a piece of academic research, it would probably um, be sent back and say, um, someone saying, your methodology is, is flawed, you need to do it better. Right? But as a journalist, not reporting on that versus reporting on that, um, those 8,000 responses are still important. Yeah? So if 4,000 head teachers say that they've had to cut staff, uh, that they had to cut cleaning staff or they're having to close early on Fridays, then that's still important information. Uh, what we've got to be careful of is that we do not portray that information as, for example, 50% of teachers, because it's not. It might be 50% of people who responded to a survey but was sent out by the union. And, and that clarity of communication is really important when you're dealing with information. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really um, echo that. I think in, in practice, as a journalist, quite often you're given other people's data. Mm. It seems like data. So surveys commissioned with a commercial intention behind them. Yeah, yeah. Um, presented as fact, as, as, as robust fact. Yeah. And it's, it is our job to decide whether or not to use that information at all. Yeah. And, and one encouraging thing I've seen... Um, and again, Ben Goldacre, I think, has had a, had a, a role in this. Is that, um, so it's a quite, a quite common trick with PR agencies to conduct a survey, and it might just be 10 people, and they send it to journalists, and journalists will just, would just in the past, would just publish it, thinking, oh, it's a survey, it must be true. Um, so you might remember like, the whole Blue Monday thing in, in January being the unhappiest day of the year, you know, which has is, which is somehow seeped into our culture. Is a complete PR... Um, yeah, fabrication. Um, I knew someone who invented National Fish and Chip Day. <laughs> so, uh, he told me a while ago to kind of promote fish and chip. But um, yeah, so um, so now journalists are, are pushing back on that, and when they're sent surveys, they're, they're they're going back and saying, well, how big was the sample size? What was the questions that were asked? And if if they cannot or will not provide that information, then journalists are saying, right, I'm not, um, I'm, I can't run that story unless you can tell me. Um, charities are guilty of this as well. The NSPCC did a terrible... Um, I'll bring up the NSPCC example. Um, because people did fall for this, and it really annoyed me. Um, this is what I wrote about it at the time. Only Vice picked up on, that, on, on, the, on the crappiness of the NSPCC. So, um, so they, they, did a, they sent out a survey-based press release saying that a tenth of, ten, of 12 to 13 year olds were addicted to porn. Now, any kind of like common sense should make you think one in 10 12 year olds, 13 year olds, one in 10 are addicted to porn. That, that, surely that that deserves a bit of question. I think because it's the NSPCC, it was as the children's charity. Um, no, they're not. Just look at the numbers. Look at how. Look at the methodology. Look at how they did this. Who did they ask? Um, you know, first of all, addiction is quite a tricky thing to measure. Um, second of all, twelve-year-olds are quite a difficult group to research. There's all sorts of ethical issues. Um, you can't just, you know, rock up at your local um, school and say, can I ask a bunch of 12-year-olds about whether they're addicted to porn or not? <laughs> um, and so, but you can see how many, how many news organisations, including the BBC, Manchester Evening News, published it. Um, so Vice, uh, as I said, they did ask, actually ask some questions, and it was conducted by a, an organ a company called OnePoll, where people are paid to do surveys, and it's like 12 peer surveys, so the, the incentive there is to just click through it and do as many as possible until you've made enough money that you can cash out. Um, so again, big methodological concerns. 
Um, I actually went to the effort of finding out how many 12 to 13 year olds there were in the country and then how many people they'd surveyed and what the margin of error was. It was about 5%. So the real figure, if you assume the actual methodology was okay, the real figure could have been anywhere between 5 and 15%. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was just horrible. Um, so don't fall into that mistake. Any other questions? We've gone on a whole margin of error tangent. Any other questions? Right, okay, so for those of you with laptops, you can play along. Um, those of you um, without, um, I can just plug my book and you can, you can get my book later and, uh, um, and use that. So, um, so I, I said there were kind of um, a number of uh, cards, the basic cards of data journalism. This, by the way, this is um, there's a great video by Simon Rogers um, talking about data journalism back in about 2011, and he, he does this talk about data journalism being a new punks. And uh, at the time, Simon was data editor at the Guardian, who uh, one of the big uh, pioneers of data journalism in the UK, still are, still one of the best data desks in the, in the industry. Um, and uh, so he talked about how in the 70s, there's a very famous record sleeve where it says, here's one chord, here's another chord, here's a third, and they go and form the band. And it's this, this kind of punk ethos that you only needed three chords to in a band and he was kind of saying data journalism was a bit the same which very much a DIY ethic, learn it yourself. Um, so the Guardian formed a data team, it was followed by the Telegraph, uh, the Times, the BBC, now all have data teams, the BBC then had the two that, that I'm involved in as well. Uh, uh, Reach started a data team in Manchester which has been massively influential as well. Um, and now, because of the shared data unit, JPI and NewsQuest, the other major regional newspaper groups, have data teams. The Economist has a data team. Archant has a data and investigations team. So this has become a widespread role. But his, he, he, I wanted to take his ideas further and say, well, actually, these are the three cards. So here's sorting, here's filtering, here's percentages. Now go and form a data journalism team. Um, and, and these are all things you can do, well, two of them you can do by just clicking buttons in Excel. You don't even have to type a formula. The last one, you do have to type a formula. Um, although, actually, there are tools online that will even do that for you. But it is worth doing it. So, um, um, where am I going to send you? Gender pay gap. What's the address? Uh, pay, gender dash pay dash gap. Let's put this up. Okay, so that's the address you want to go to. And you should be able to download the data. This is constantly updated. Uh, so this is, where, this is what it looks like. If you look for the link that says download all gender pay gap data, and you can get, uh, actually that's not that many, oh, I guess we aren't at the deadline yet. Um, so if you download last year's actually, no actually, but let's download this year's because it's smaller, it'll download quicker. So 2019 to 20. Um, I don't need me to put the address back up from before. Yeah. Oops. Let's get rid of that. There you go. So I'll click on download the data and then download the data. Um, 
you have two full years worth of data, 2017, no, 2018, 19. Yeah, I was right in the first place. 2017, 18, 2018, 19. And then you've got what's been submitted so far for this year, which is 2019, 20. The reason this number is so much smaller is because the deadline is the end of the financial year, so the end of March, um, and most people will leave it until that last minute to do it. And some indeed will submit it late. Okay? And when you open it, it should look something like this. And you can open it in Google Sheets as well. Okay, how is everyone so far? I'll have to trust, I can only see the backs of your laptops, so I'll have to trust that those of you playing along are okay. Um, so this is, this is the data. The first thing to do with any um, data set is look along the columns and have a think about possible story ideas. So we've got the name of the employer, we've got the address, a company number, SIC codes, you would go off and Google, what are SIC codes, anyone know? Uh, the standard industry classification code, so it's basically a code that, that uh, identifies the industry or industries that they work in. Um, we've got diff mean hourly percent and some similar columns coming after that. If I go back here to the Gender Pay Gap website, and if I type in Newcastle University, for example, um, then uh, I can see what the information is like for just one organisation. So we've got 82p for women for every pound. Now, if I search for uh, Newcastle University in this data, oh, oh of course, because it's the current year, isn't it? Um, let's do it a different way then. Let's look for... I'm going to search for something I know is in the data, because it's the first row here, One Life Management Solutions. So... So we've got one pound for every one pound. Median hourly wage is 0.5% higher. Now you can see here, minus 0.5 is the. So this figure is the same as this one. Um, and the mean hourly wage is 11% lower. So mean is here 11. So without going through every column, I just want to show you that that process, it's quite useful when you're looking at a data set and you've also got a website with individual instances, you can kind of try and work out what the numbers relate to. So what this means, this column is the difference in pay between women and men. And if it's a positive figure, that means that men are paid more than women. If it's a negative figure, then it means that women are paid more than men. So at this company, on average, uh, men are paid 11% more, but this company, on average, men are paid 2.3% less. So this refers to men, essentially. Um, I'm assuming on the basis that most of the time it's going to be men that, that are paid more than women. And this is a median hourly wage. Uh, anyone know um, what a median is? I didn't expect to get so statistical today. Yeah, go on. It's basically just the number that's in the middle of all the data. Yeah, it's the number that's in the middle. So the, um, the median age in this room would be, if we lined you up from the youngest to the oldest, and then pick the middle person, or if there were two, the two in the middle and the midpoint between them, um, that would be the median. So the median, half of the values are, are always higher and half are lower, which is what you kind of assume with an average. Uh, but a mean average, which is what people normally mean when they talk about an average, is when you add up all the numbers and divide by the total of people. 
So if we had someone in this room, um, trying to think, who was the person who never died? But anyway, uh, you know, if we had someone in this room who'd lived for 100,000 years, unbeknownst to us, um, then that would skew the average. The average age would be, I don't know, 90 years old or something, even though um, everyone, most people would below that number. So averages can be skewed by high earning or high numbers. Yeah? I was very briefly dead, only 46. I, I, thought, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to confess to being 100,000 years old. Um, so, um, 17 uh, years since have been very good. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and actually I came across uh, a company in Birmingham where the mean average gap was nine, minus 98%. So in other words, women on average in that company were earning 98% more than men. Um, but the median pay gap was actually in favour of men. Now, what that told me was there was a woman or some woman in that organisation earning a shed load of money to skew that average, that mean. And so I went on company's house and I looked at the pay and indeed there was, a, there was a female director and I could see how much the highest director was getting paid and I could see that also they'd increased their wage in the last year by about 20% and I could see that they'd, they'd laid off about 10,000 staff. So um, that was an example of the data leading me to a particular individual, a particular organisation that might be a story. The story itself might not have any numbers in it but the data's leading me to an, to an outlier. And that's what sorting is. So if you've got the data open, um, go into column E, um, and um, now this will vary depending on the type of uh, version of Excel you've got, um, but you should have a data tab. So across the top of your screen, you've got home, insert, draw, page layout, formulas, data, something like that. Yeah. And then one of us is data. Yeah. I'm looking for some reassuring, vague nods. Yeah. Um, so make sure you're somewhere in that column. It doesn't matter where. And you should see some buttons around the middle. Don't click on any of them yet. Um, there's a really big one that says sort. Don't click on that. Um, because that's more powerful and you don't need it. Next to that there's a button called filter, don't click on that yet. To the left of the sort button there's an A to Z button and a Z to A button. Um, those are the really useful ones. If you click on Z to A it will sort the whole spreadsheet by that column. So you should get the biggest numbers at the top. And in, in my case, I've got T-Class Security Limited at the top with a 100% pay gap. Yeah? So that sorting has brought, um, if you like, the worst company for pay men, men more than women to the top. And that could be the end of our process. At this point, we pick up the phone, or we, we find out the phone number, and we call them, or we go around, and we tell a story about this, this company, or we find out why. And this why question is really important. Um, often, data journalism is about finding out what is happening, where, by who, when, and then the journalism that comes after that is finding out why. Any ideas why this company might have a 100% pay gap? They don't employ anyone else. Yeah, that'd be an obvious hypothesis. So, so let's say we didn't think of that and we picked up the phone. Why are you paying men so much more than women? We don't have any women staff. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it, it helps you kind of um, ask the questions. Uh, this company might be more interesting and what company is it? Football club. Football club. Any ideas why that? Why the pay gap might be so big? They're doing different jobs, and the men, the male football players, would get paid the most out of anybody, except maybe the manager, who is a man. Yeah. <laughs> so this this is the uh, football equivalent of their hundred thousand year old uh, student. We've got eleven men on the pitch uh, because it's a men's football club. 
um, plus however many uh, reserves and the manager who are on millions and millions of pounds. There's not going to be anyone else at that club um, in normal jobs. Um, even if every other employee in that, in that club was a woman, those men on the pitch would skew that average massively. Um, but any ideas? Any ideas for stories at this point? Yeah? Uh, what it is to be, even though, yeah, it's skewed because of the male football players, look at the big gap between male and female, because I'm sure there's a female. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly, yeah. So I'm already thinking, what, let's look at other football, let's look at it in comparison. Because this is the, the worst football club in this data. Now, this isn't all the companies yet. But is it that Leeds actually, even within football, has a big gender pay gap? Uh, maybe Newcastle has 60%, and Man United has 65 or whatever, but, or let's look at women's and men's football clubs and the gender pay gap um, in women's football clubs. Um, let's, let's forget about men's football clubs completely and just look at women's football clubs. So it's already sparking off ideas in terms of avenues that could go down. Um, and you can tell, by the way, this is, this is where the mean and the median are quite useful here because the median is still quite big, um, but it's not skewed by those people on the pitch. And if we were to look at the gender pay gap in football clubs, that's probably the figure we would be looking at. So let's sort it by that column. If you make sure you're in F in column F and click Z to A again. Um, now that's quite interesting. So again, we've got this security company where we, we're guessing that all the employees are men, but we'd still probably pick up the phone to check. Um, the, ne the next highest median hourly percent is 80, uh, uh, difference is 83%. So um, the, the kind of typical male employee there is paid 83% more, 84% more than the, the typical female. Any, any theories there why that might be the case? So this is a, a GP federation, so local doctors. Yeah, so it could be, and again we're talking about it could be different people doing different jobs. So my hypothesis here is that all the GPs are male and all the female staff are non-GPs on much lower wages. But again, we, we'd uh, pick up the phone to find out more. Um, and we've got another health company here as well. Um, okay. Now, Go back to column E and press A to Z to sort it from smallest to largest. And now we're getting the companies where uh, there are women being paid significantly more than men on average. Um, we've got whatever this company is, Logo Plest UK Limited. It's a plastic fabrication company, according to that. Um, we've got Flight Care Limited, which has a 70% pay gap in favour of women uh, in terms of mean average, but the median is completely is, is zero. So again, this might be some, you know, some highly paid people or one highly paid, paid person, woman at the top of the company. So that, that's just a demonstration of how sorting can be used um, just to, to kind of bring things to the top, outliers, and give you potential story ideas, potential leads. Again, it might just be a couple of minutes, and then you pick up the phone and start calling around. The next thing is filters. Um, next to that sort button, I've pointed out this filter button up here. If you click that, doesn't matter, just make sure you're somewhere in the data. But don't select more than one cell, just make sure you're on one cell. And then click the filter button. And what should happen is you will see a drop down menu at the top of every column. 
Yeah. Again, I'm looking for some reassuring notes. Uh, so, so click on the filter button in that data area across the top. Um, so in this in this case we can uh, we can narrow down into our data. Um, so again, I said about looking across the columns. So before we before we do narrow down, so what possible stories are there around the employer name, or what what stories can we tell including the employer name? We've already mentioned a couple football clubs. So that information, the football, the, the fact that it's a football club, is in that column. Uh, what other type of employer names might we look for? So limited company or PLC. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could look at the look for limited, look for PLC, things like that. Um, what else? So we've also had the schools, the academy schools. Um, we had the media organisations. Um, we could look for organisations that have been in the news. Um, so BBC has been in the news around gender and, and pay. So we might look for them. So that's just that column. What about the addresses? What might what information in the addresses column might we use to find a story? Brilliant. Okay, so let's do that. So if you cl if you click on that drop down menu that you should now have at the top of column D, um, you will see a list of all the values in that column, which you don't want to go through and, and tick. But just above that, somewhere hopefully, you should have some sort of search box. Um, if you start typing Newcastle, then it will you'll. Uh, again, depending on your version of Excel, behind here you should start to see your data being filtered. Uh, is that happening for, for you? Sorry? There are, which is actually a lovely film. When, when I realised this, I was like, oh yes, this is the <laughs> sort of thing I enjoy getting my teeth into. So, so yeah, just um, so once that filter is applied, click back to your data. Um, and what you've got now is, is a subset of your data which just shows uh, companies with, with the word Newcastle in the address. Now, that could be this Newcastle, it could be Newcastle and Lyme, it could be someone uh, with a business on Newcastle Street in the Shetland Islands, um, or Newcastle Centre. Uh, and we've got to look at this like a computer does, really, in, in, you know, as just a series of characters. It doesn't have any meaning like it does for us. Um, when this filter's applied, you'll notice that the raw numbers turn blue. So I've got 59 and 122 uh, that are now blue, and they're not in sequence anymore, because the ones that don't match the filter are being hidden. Um, so that data is still there, we just can't see it anymore. So it's probably a good idea to copy this filtered information and paste it into a new sheet in our spreadsheet. To do that, um, click somewhere in your data, and then um, you want to select all the data that you can see. The quickest way of doing it is pressing Control and A if you're on a PC. Windows machine, or Command and A on a Mac. Uh, so that's going to select the whole table, only the filtered stuff. Then press Control and C, or Command and C, to copy it. And then uh, towards the bottom of your, your workbook, your um, spreadsheet, create a new sheet by clicking on the little plus button. And then Control and V will paste what you have copied, or Command and V on a Mac. So I'll go through that one more time. Uh, this time, let's create the sheet first. So at the bottom of your spreadsheet, you've got the, the numbers, the names of the sheets that you're working with. And there should be a little plus button to create a new one. Then go to your data that you filtered, 
click on any of the cells, then press Control and A. Oops, that was well done. Control and A to select it all. Control and C to copy it, or Command and A, Command and C. Then switch to the empty spreadsheet. Control and V to paste. And you'll notice uh, this has got, in my case, there's 24 rows now, and they're all in sequence, they're not blue. So it's just copied that filtered data. Any questions so far? Okay. So, um, so at this point, we, we, we've gone from, we had two phase in there, we've now got less than 50, I think. I've forgotten that number already. Don't have to be good with numbers. 24, there you go, 23. Um, so we, could, we can now focus on these. We could see which was top or bottom. Um, and even though we've got Newcastle under Lyme in here and other stuff, if I, let's search again by this, um, by median pay gap. And the top one is in Newcastle upon time. So, um, so it's not such a problem that there's other companies in here, or other Newcastles in here, if I, if I still want to find the top one with a Newcastle address. Because I can just manually narrow down as well. And that, that happens quite often in data journalism, is that you use the data journalism skills to do 90% of the, of the filtering or the sorting, and then you are that last step. You do that last kind of checking or pursuing or whatever it is. There are ways of narrowing it down to Newcastle upon time. Any ideas? Go on. I just tried to do a case searching for Newcastle upon time, and it gives me lesser results. Yeah, so you look for the whole uh, yeah. Newcastle upon time. So that's going to be more specific, but we might lose some um, uh, that are in Newcastle but haven't used the full term. So that would be one, one approach, yeah? What else? Postcode, yeah, any. So that's why I was fiddling around, but I, I was like, okay, how do I do this, right? Um, I won't bore you with how I did it, but yeah. But that, but th th that kind of um, logical process of thinking about, well, how could I do this? And then you would go off and Google, like, how do I match partial postcodes? And there's tons of things, tons of techniques you can find just by searching around. Um, so that's filters. Um, Uh, ignore all of that. Um, now, calculations. Uh, we'll do calculations in a minute. Um, I'm going to move on to a different data set. I've got about 10 minutes. Uh, think of how quickly we can get through this. Okay. Let's try it. So go to data.police.uk. This is a great resource um, for, actually, for getting real stories, actually. And, and funnily enough, yesterday I overheard someone uh, talking to someone else in the BBC who was clearly working on this sort of story. So it does demonstrate that, uh, that you can get publishable stories from this week after week. So, uh, data.police.uk. Let's. Here we go. And uh, there's a tab there that says data. And you can download data for any police force and uh, for a particular date range. Um, it defaults to the latest month. So the, the latest month for which there is data is January. And this is quite common. It's um, wait a few weeks and February's data will come out. But it's generally going to be a, a couple of months behind so when you report on this, it's always according to the latest data or new data says. So we're going to pick uh, Northumberland, uh, Northumbria, sorry, police, uh, unless you prefer another police force. And then at the bottom, it, uh, it's currently got crime data ticked, but let's look at stop and search data instead. Um, in fact, just tick all three and then click Generate File. 
And after a moment, you will get a link to download the data. And it will download as a zip file. Anyone want me to go through that again? So data.police.uk, go to the data tab. Um, select what data you want. And then you'll get a zip file that looks like, when it opens, There you go. So it'll have probably three files in it. It'll have one that ends with outcomes.csv, one that says stop and search, one that says street. Um, the street.csv one is crimes. So it's got a row for every crime. The outcomes one tells you the outcomes of crimes. So whether it was uh, closed without any suspect identified or if uh, someone was, if it was some court action, uh, community resolution. And then stop and search tells you every time that a police officer stopped someone and searched them uh, from that force. So if you open up the stop and search data, now this is uh, very useful data because stop and search is regularly controversial uh, and also regularly it's regularly proposed that it's uh, expanded or increased uh, was quite recently <coughs> so again look across the columns what possible stories are there in this data how many actually result in arrests yes so what column was that in uh, I don't have the letters on M, yeah, so column M, uh, outcome, we've got no further action, no further action, arrest, arrest, no further action, and so on. So, yeah, how many, uh, in fact, that's a, that's a really good one that I think we will do. So, how many led to some sort of arrest, yeah? What else? Gender, sort of. Gender, yeah, so uh, how many female versus male? The age. Yeah, so what's the most common, any guesses which age group would be most... That's what I thought as well, it's not. Um, or at least wasn't in January. Um, by the way, you notice this October 17. Any ideas what that means? Sorry? Um, no? Why do you think it's under 18? I'll tell you what it is. It's 10 to 17 being treated as November 2007, uh, sorry, October 2017. Um, and this is quite useful because it's, it's displaying a, a number as a date, but the, the underlying information is still the same. So if, uh, and that's one of the most common panics of the spreadsheet, is you see a date and you think, why is this a date? It should be something else. So it's just formatting, you can just uh, format it. Okay, so age is another. What else? Ethnicity, Ethnicity is, is uh, probably one of the most obvious ones. That's, that's where a lot of the controversy is, that um, police officers stop and search uh, non-white people much more often than white people. Um, um, Officer-defined ethnicity, I, I assume that that is the ethnicity of the officer. But I don't know, so I'd have to find out a bit more. So what, what might we be interested in in terms of the officer's ethnicity? Yeah, so are uh, white police officers more likely to stop non-white than, than vice versa? Um, what else? Yeah, reason why they're being stopped. Um, Time of arrest, go on, go on, yeah, what about time of arrest? Who said that? Is it your issue? Yeah. We're just like, yeah, when they, when they stopped or in certain the investigation. Or well, again, what would, what would you expect perhaps to be the most common time to be stopped and searched? Like, like, 
Yeah, night time. Well, the other thing as well, this, this date, what, what other information does that give us apart from time? It's New Year's. Sorry? New Year's. Yeah, so we've got, um, you know, like what about New Year's Eve or Halloween or um, Christmas Day? Uh, what else would it tell us? Doesn't, it's not obvious here. We could extract it from this. Uh, from, from this column, from the date column. Yeah, yeah, so it could be groups of people, yeah, at the same time, yeah. How long they were with the police officer? Um, I don't think it has an end time. I think it's just... Yeah, it's just, it's just the, the time it was recorded, yeah. Uh, it could be day of the week, so our Friday is worse than, you know, Sunday mornings or whatever. Um... We've got removal of more than just eight of clothing, so how many times um, was that invoked? And again, we might do a bit of research to find out what that actually means. Or, one useful thing is, when are police allowed to do some of these things? Um, and it's, all, it's always uh, useful to find out what, what uh, people should be doing. What should the authorities, what, what are their guidelines, what are their regulations, what are their recommendations? Um, I sent an FOI off uh, a few weeks ago, and, and it's, it's about, I'm trying not to give away the story, but uh, it's about the use of something in prisons. And as part of that, I found, you know, I found out what should happen in prisons, and then I've asked questions about, essentially, were these guidelines followed or, you know, was this information recorded and so on. So that is making me think, you know, yes, I might have a story about one time in ten people are asked to remove clothing, but the so what question is going to be, well, is, is that good, is that bad, should they be doing it, in what situations? So if I can find something that says, police can only ask for removal of eight of clothing if it's under the Misuse of Drugs Act, and I can find that they're doing it under other legislation, then that's going to be a much stronger story. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking over again. <laughs> I was assaulted, and I was CCTV footage, and the police wouldn't give me it. They wouldn't give you the CCTV footage? CCTV is tricky because most of it is in the private sector, so it wouldn't be controlled by FOI. You won't be able to get information through FOI. But um, it, is, it does come under data protection legislation, so you could request what you could do what's called a subject access request about information held about you. Um, and that the CCTV footage being of you would be covered by that. Um, likewise, if it's gone through a police force, you could try and use FOI, but there are exemptions about it being involved in. Yeah. I eventually got some, but it was heavily. Heavy. Yeah, yeah. It's it, so it's you probably done. The only things I could think of really, but yeah. Um, let's do this. Um, what was the, what was your idea again? Uh, how many led to arrest? How many led to arrest? Okay. So I'll, I'll show you what's called a pivot table. What a pivot table does is create an overview of this data in some sort of aggregate form. So uh, we pick a, a column like um, outcome and we can, instead of having to count, okay, how many were arrested and so on, a pivot table will do this for us in seconds. To create a pivot table in Excel, you go to the insert menu on most versions of Excel and normally it's the first button uh, pivot table. If it's not there, then look under the data uh, view instead. Make sure you, again, somewhere on your data, you just need to be on one of the cells, and then click that pivot table button. 
a window should appear. You just click OK. And it should create a new um, sheet with an empty pivot table on. Okay? Any reassuring notes? Um, in uh, Google Sheets, you can do this in the data tab. So if you open this up in Google Sheets, go to data and then pivot table, you'll get the same sort of thing. And what you have is on the left is the empty pivot table, on the right is where you build it. So you do the work here, the results appear there. The two main areas to focus on are the rows box and the values box. Uh, the rows are going to be the who of your story. And the values are any calculations you want to do. So if you want to count things or add things up, you put it in values. So what's our rows about? What's our story about in this data? What's your name, sir? Sean. Sean. What was Sean's idea? How many arrests were, uh, were taken from all the searches? So what, what information is that in our data? What was the column called? Uh, outcome. OK. So outcome is going to go in here. Now all the columns are up here in where it says pivot table fields. So field is another word for column. So you want to drag the outcome field down to rows. So you click on outcome and you drag it down into this rows box. I'll just do that again to show you again. So I'm going to click and drag down to there. So now in that rows box it says outcome and over here our table has changed and instead of a couple of thousand rows of raw data we've now just got the five values that appear in that column. So we can see that there are five outcomes in our data. What do we want to calculate about these outcomes? Yeah, we just want to count how many there are. So actually we can drag it again into values and count how many of each outcome there was. Okay? Again, I'll do that once more. So I'll click and drag into values and it's going to count now. So you'll notice it says count of outcome. Um, if you want to count something, it's always better to use a text column because it will count by default. You can't do anything else really with count. If you drag a numerical column in there, it will add it all up. It will create a sum of all the numbers. Um, and there are other things you can do as well. But So that's what you should have. And that, that takes a few seconds once you get into the practice of doing it. We've got each of the uh, outcome categories, and we've got a count of how many each occurs in the data of a grand total. So now we can answer the question, how many resulted in an arrest? So we've got 72 resulted in an arrest, out of 510. So um, we're going to calculate a proportion. Uh, you can pick any empty cell to just do this. And the first thing we type is an equal sign. Uh, if you want Excel to do any work for you or Google Sheets, you always start with an equal sign. If you don't start with an equal sign, it just assumes you're entering data. But we want it to do some work. So equals is always the first character, and we only use it once. And then that's followed by whatever calculation or formula we want to do. And we're going to calculate the part divided by the whole. So 72 is the part, and the whole is 510. So we're going to divide it by that. The slash means divide, and 510 is the whole. So back to calculate a proportion, we're dividing the part by the whole. In this case, 72 divided by 510. And if we press enter, we'll get a, a decimal figure. Uh, and this means 14%. So 1 would be a whole 1, it would be 100%. 0 0.5 would be half, it would be 50%. 0 0.1 would be 10%. 0 
So we can see this is 14%. Um, if that bothers you, you can just multiply it by 100. So it equals that times 100. Uh, or you can just format it as a percent. So, um, yeah. To format it, you right click and go to Format Cells and you can specify percent. But I'm going to do that very quick and then not do it just so you know it's possible. But well, hopefully you should say it's 14%. So 14% of stocks resulting in, in, in a rest. We can see there are some other outcomes as well, so we might talk more generally about how many um, result in some sort of action. We might add those up. We might talk about how many stops and searches resulted in no action. But you get the general process of how to do that. Um, I'm conscious we've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to stop there, um, and I will just uh, round up. Uh, as I said, this book goes through the process of, of, uh, of how to do pivot tables. The idea is uh, very quick. When I say book, it's basically the length of a chapter. It's, it's um, not very long at all. And the idea is when you just... Uh, up against the deadline, you turn it around things quickly. Um, but just to, to round up the key points, um, you can use sorting to find outliers, you can use filters to drill down to particular areas, um, and you can use percentage calculations to look at how much, how big a problem is or is not. You can also look at change, so you can divide the change by uh, what it was originally. Um, so to give you an example, if there were 200 cases of coronavirus today, and um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make sure I've got an easy calculation to make. Um, no, I'll make it easier. So yesterday there were 200, 200 cases, and today there were 250. So the change is 50. We divide that change by the starting number. So I'll divide that 50 by 200 and we would get 0 0.25, which is 25%, so cases have gone up by a quarter. So the same calculation can be used to calculate change as well. You can use pivot tables to focus on those areas, compare them, compare categories, and combine some of those techniques as well. But perhaps um, most importantly, don't spend all your time in the data um, Use that other piece of technology on your desk, which is your phone. Um, it would be much quicker. There's only so much you will probably get out of the data itself. But when you pick up that phone, you know who you're going to be dialing, you know what you're going to be asking. And it's always better in journalism to ask for confirmation than to ask for secrets. Yeah? So if, if, if you say to them, you know, what's going wrong with your, what's, what's, what's bad? In your company right now. You're not going to turn around and say, yeah, we're really terrible. Um, we're stopping all these people for no reason whatsoever. But if you phone them up and say, you're stopping all these people for no reason whatsoever, aren't you? Um, can, can you explain why? Then already you're further ahead. Okay, so um, I'm hoping no one's loitering outside. Any, any questions in the time you have left? said because they're reporting what someone else has said, in some quotes, or, um, <coughs> but yeah, how, how do you avoid saying that? You, you, I think the main thing is accuracy of language. So whenever, and that's just a general journalism principle anyway, regardless of whether it's about data or something else, um, you make sure you know what the words you are using mean, and that those words are being used in, in an accurate way. So, um, so even simple things like crime has gone up, actually it's reports of crime have gone up, yeah, because there are lots of crime that is not reported, victimless crime and so on. 
Um, so, so I guess to boil that down, know what the units of measurement are is really important. What is actually being measured? It's not crime. It's reports of crime or people's experiences of crime.